Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar this evening on continuous diffusion of oxygen, promoting cost effectiveness and patient independence in wound healing. And before we get started, I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping items uh, so that you know how to participate in today's event. You can submit questions to our presenters by typing them into the question panel found by clicking on the Q&A icon along the bottom menu. You may submit your questions at any time and we'll collect them and address them actually in the Q&A portion at the end of the session. So our objectives for today's session are to review a recent health economics evaluation on continuous diffusion of ox oxygen, learn about the supportive science behind CDO, and we've got some really interesting cases that demonstrate patient independence, wound healing, limb salvage, and pain management while doing CDO. I'd like now to introduce Edie Artrell, who graduated from nursing in 1975, and she completed her degree at the University of Calgary in 1995. She became an ET nurse, now called an NSWAC nurse, in 2000 and re received a certificate of completion in the International Interdisciplinary Wound Care course from the University of Toronto in 2002. Edie has worked in various capacities for Alberta Health Services with the focus on skin and wound care and management education and supporting practice change. She's also an, a, a national consultant for EO2. So Edie's presentation starts with one of her patients, Bill, talking about his experience with CDO and how he was able to manage it independently. I have had two wounds, one of which has healed. We used iodazorb pretty well as the main stay and it took its time but it worked. I got a second wound in middle of March roughly. Uh, used the same sort of protocol but it didn't seem to be moving forward as it was. So clinicians suggested we try EO2 and I said sure I'm game for that. So I had a piece of equipment uh, sent to me along with the dressings. Uh, I followed the instructions. Uh, took two days to get comfortable with the process. Um, I was able to wear athletic shorts during the time with EO2. Uh, I wore the, <clears throat> the equipment underneath the shorts. It worked very well. Uh, the tubing was not an issue after a couple of days and using compression socks to make sure the tubing didn't get uh, snagged anywhere. Uh, changing the dressings was no problem. It was actually quite simple uh, once you had the confidence that it wasn't going to uh, really blow up on you. It took um, just a matter of uh, short minutes to unscrew tubes, put take off dressing, put new dressing on, and then rehook it up. The uh, <clears throat> dur during the time period, uh, the wound got smaller and smaller, which was nice. And but during that time, I did have uh, electronic access via text or pictures to the clinician and was able to just discuss it as it was proceeding. So although I was doing all of this at home, it was as if someone was, was with me. Uh, <clears throat> the wound, as I said, got smaller and smaller, and uh, hopefully in the next week or so, it will have gone away. Uh, I had uh, good results and uh, I'm very happy with the use of it, and when I look back on it, it really was a very uh, simple process. So uh, I am quite happy with the results. Good morning. I'd like to share a patient with you 
Bill, who is 73 years old, has been diagnosed with prediabetes and marginal venous insufficiency. In March of 2020, he noticed a small red area on the lower leg that broke open, and he was uh, self-treating leaving it open to the air to dry out, which he thought was a good strategy. Unfortunately, the wound kept getting bigger and there was an increase in drainage. So he started using band-aids to cover the wound and then moved to a gauze um, uh, dressing to cover the area. And at that point, home care became involved. This is the um, picture of wound of, of Bill's wound on April 30th and he also uh, indicated that the area was quite painful there was slough present quite poor looking granulation tissue the peri wound area was pink reddish but not warm to touch and measurements taken by the patient at that time were 2.5 by 2.8 so a uh, dressing protocol was um, created. Uh, we used polycadexmer iodine uh, to, with an absorptive foam dressing for 14 days. And the rationale for that was to address the bacterial lobe, provide some autolytic debridement and absorb the exudate and potentially address biofilm if that may have been present. Uh, his vascular status, he did have some lower limb edema, stating that um, the edema was, was less in the morning and increasing throughout the day. He has uh, no lower limb as assessment at that point, and that was recommended. And he did have pedal pulses uh, taken by his partner, and he also had 20 to 30 milligram um, mercury milligram <laughs> compression stockings, which he was not wearing. He was concerned about wearing compression over his wound, but um, it, he was supported to start wearing his compression stockings and to don them in the morning and doff them at bedtime. And we also uh, requested a lower limb assessment to see what his vascular status was. His lower limb skin was also very dry, so um, a medical grade cream was also encouraged. And uh, because he had some venous insufficiency, he was directed to do a patch test before he uh, applied the cream to his full limb. He was given education uh, to support his confidence and success in completing his dressing changes as well as managing his own wound care. Um, he was um, to monitor his wound, so we talked about what he was to look for, the drainage, what the wound bed colors looked like, if there was yellow sluffy material or red granulation tissue in the bed, the drainage, um, the amount of drainage he was having and if there was odor and if the amount changed. And we wanted to uh, reduce or minimize cross-contamination and potential recurrent wound infections so we talked a little bit about storing and caring for his supplies, proper cleaning uh, instructions, hand washing, changes in his wound pain or discomfort, and uh, not to peek at his wound, which Bill did admit that he liked to do on a frequent basis. So after two months of uh, moist wound healing, when he started uh, putting dressings over his wound, uh, that's when I got involved. Um, lower leg assessment still hadn't been completed, and we initiated EO2 on May 15th after the 14 days of antimicrobial therapy. On June 14th, he needed another round. Uh, we did a primary dressing again for 14 days, and uh, the patient was very engaged with his care, and um, we communicated quite successfully electronically. He's even sending me diagrams as well as photographs. This is the timeline, the progression of his wound over the next two months. And you can see that each uh, photograph shows um, a change in size over time. So the EO2 was, was working very well for him. <music>
So in conclusion, uh, Bill had, has his wound for six months. Uh, as you can see from the last photograph, um, he is back down to wearing a Band-Aid over the wound. Um, EO2 was discontinued as he felt that uh, the wound was almost closed and uh, he wanted to see if his body could um, get to full closure uh, on its own. Um, so he had two months of his own management, two months of, of home care management and um, very little change, two months of EO2. And at that point, we started to see the migrating edges supporting um, progression to wound closure. He was wearing his compression hosiery over the EO2 dressing, and that was not an issue for him. He was able to complete his dressing changes independently at home and through professional assessments via the photos and periodic phone calls to me, coupled with periodic home care visits. Um, we were able to successfully get his wound to a place where we're looking at closure over the next week or so. Patient education and ongoing support promoted success for this client and it was uh, ending up being very cost efficient because um, he felt very comfortable and confident in doing his dressings independently. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Mark Niederauer. Mark earned a PhD in biochemical engineering with a focus in genetics from Iowa State University. He is a Fulbright Scholar from Stuttgart, Germany, and a fellow of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering. He has more than 25 years experience in research development, manufacturing, and commercialization of pharmaceuticals and medical devices for tissue repair, including surgical instruments, res resorptible scaffolds, dressings, wound oxygenation and monitoring, and electromechanical diagnostics. He has numerous publications and is the co-inventor of multiple patents for devices and methods used in orthopedic surgery, tissue engineering, and wound care. Please take it away, Mark. Thank you, Karen. I appreciate you, the introduction. Good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, we're gonna to talk a little bit about uh, most recent evidence we have and current underlying factors for why CDO works in wound healing. I'm going to start, next slide. I'm going to start with a double-blinded study that was actually fully blinded. Uh, both the patients and clinicians were blinded, as you can see here visually. This study involved oxygen going to a wound dressing with offloading. And the entire systems were identical in both arms. The only difference was in the placebo arm that it was an active device, but the oxygen flowed inside the device that did not go to the wound bed. Otherwise, all the dressings, offloading, everything else was identical. Next. So an overview of how the study was set up, we were looking at primary, uh, the outcome being full wound closure. Secondary outcomes, which I'm gonna focus on first, included time to wound closure, effect of the baseline wound size on wound closure rates, and also effect of wound chronicity because we had run-in period, uh, which only moisture therapy is applied in both arms uh, prior to applying CDO devices. Uh, and we looked at how fast the wounds were closing during that part. Uh, this is con conducted in the continental United States, 134 centers with 146 patients. And the demographics were identical in both arms, uh, even in the sub-analyses. Next. So first looking at the uh, time to wound closure, we looked at time to reach 50%, 75%, and 100% wound closure. And you see overall, including all patients that dropped, so 146 patients, uh, we saw a significant decrease in the amount of time uh, to get to each one of those stages. For example, if you look at at the time to fit, it was almost half uh, and statistical significance of 0 0.001. Next. Now, looking at wound size, what we agreed to do there was look at the wound sizes we had and divide into quartiles. Uh, each quartile group had similar numbers in both active and placebo. And what you see on the axis, the y axis, is the relative performance, so the number of wounds that closed in CDO versus the placebo. And on the bottom, you can see the median wound size, and you see as the wounds get larger, uh, 
the relative effect became greater. Next. And this is something we similarly we see in wound chronicity and other areas too, which I'll cover here in a minute. Here, this graph shows something similar. Uh, you can see on the left, that bullet, that's our overall results. Uh, that was our inclusion criteria. It was about double the amount of wounds that closed with CDO versus motion therapy alone. So basically, motion therapy adding oxygen to the wound. As you go towards the more chronic wounds, uh, which we assessed by removing wounds that weren't as, they closed quicker during the running period, you can see that the relative performance increased from uh, more than twice as much to more than three times as much. And what's also interesting, because the delta became larger, the statistical significance actually increased, even though there's a, a fewer patients. And this is a common theme. I think I mentioned this before, that it appears the more you need CDO, the better it works. Next slide. So in summary, uh, this study was published in Journal of Wound Care and more recently in Wounds. Um, it was designed with the United States Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is our reimbursement agency. And they cited this as being the gold standard for how states should be going forward. In summary, you can see in the papers, there's more results published than what we talked about here. Overall, we closed more than twice as many wounds. However, as the wounds got larger, more chronic, we're in weight-bearing services so on the plantar aspect of the foot. Um, and frequently in debrided wounds, the delta, the results got better for CDO. And interestingly, when we look at the patients that drop due to severe infection uh, for hospitalization, CDO resulted in 75% decrease in severe hospitalizations. Next. The next thing I want to talk about is a pain study. This is a pilot study done with 20 patients. Uh, this was done by a group of nurses up in Chicago. Uh, this was set up so that uh, the nurses could choose pains, uh, wounds as long as they were painful. They could choose what type of wounds they wanted to treat and see which ones responded best. Next slide. So what you'll see on this next slide is that they tended towards leg ulcers that had a vascular component to them, i.e. very painful. The overall median pain was eight across the board, but here you can see the different wound types. Next. And what was really interesting is that 100% uh, of the patients, actually 100% of the wounds reported complete pain relief, all went to zero except for one while the wounds were still open. So if you wanted to look at how fast this happened, uh, by the first visit, which is a median of four days, average just over three, um, over half the patients had at least a 75% reduction in pain. So fairly significant reduction fairly quickly. And one of the things we did not record, this was actually just in the nurse's notes, is that multiple patients re reported pain relief the first day. Next. So if we look at wound closure in that study, 83% experienced significant or complete closure. These were much larger wounds than the previous study discussed, up to 117 centimeters squared um, was the largest. That person uh, had a base pain of 10 and went to zero by the first follow-up visit. Also, if we look at the wounds that didn't close, what was interesting is that we still saw significant pain relief, actually even more dramatic than the overall group. 75% uh, were pain-free by the first follow-up visit which is uh, compared to 39% for the overall group. And in the study, even though we didn't track narcotic usage or drug usage, um, multiple uh, patients reported stopping uh, narcotic pain coaster with CDO. Next. So now I'm gonna switch gears and go into studies that are either recently published within the last few weeks, International Wound Journal, for example, with UT Southwestern and Labry. Also then Baylor College of Medicine, we have a couple of pilots ongoing there and those are interim results. Next. So the first I'm talking about, this is just recently published. Uh, the full paper can be found on our website. It's, it's, on, it's open publish. Uh, this looked at just a three week time period and trying to look at underlying factors why wounds are healing. So we looked at growth factors, cytokines and wound perfusion. And that's actually non-invasive methods. So it looked at per peripheral wound perfusion using TCOM. Uh, you can see there in the three week time period, over half the patients had at least a 50% wound area reduction. These were chronic wounds going in. And what's really interesting is that the first week we saw significant increases in cytokines and growth factors. Uh, for growth factors, for example, ranging from almost 300% to over 800% in things like VEGF, TAGF beta, PDGF, and IGF-1. And cytokines also had uh, significant increases. However, they were a little more delayed. Uh, some peaked in the first week, some in the second week. I'll show you in the next page graph. And as I mentioned before, 
we did see uh, significant increases in TCOMs, which is, I was not expecting because that is peripheral to the wound, not in the wound bed. Next. So here you can see the, the timeline of the cytokines and growth factors. Uh, the growth factors are the four on the left, the cytokines are the three on the right. Uh, the growth factors peaked in week one. Uh, cytokines actually, two of the three peaked in week two and then decreased, which follows a fairly standard inflammatory response to a chronic wound reawakening. Next. And finally, these two studies, I'm just going to give you a brief overview. Again, these are also available on our website or at Baylor, if you want to look at them up as posters. One, our first study is the top left, toe amputation study. We were trying to look at preventing tissue necrosis in toe amputations. Because we've seen this in the field, we want to try to investigate this in a more formal uh, study. So this again is a short study. This is, these are amputations, so it's surgical, uh, only a four week study. And at four weeks we saw, or, or at interim, we saw no necrosis with CDO. So another one's reopened. Um, versus a 43% incidence of tissue necrosis going on in the control group. If you look at the amount of successful complete healing at four weeks, 75% with CDO versus 29 in the control, and a wound length reduction also 70% greater with CDO than in the control group. And because of that wound length reduction, a second study was started uh, looking at interior neck sur surgery scar reduction, uh, and this is for thyroid or parathyroid surgery. And what they looked at there was not only better scar visualization, which is more qualitative, but also quantitatively using lasers, looked at scar length reduction. Saw a 40% greater scar length reduction in that surgery with CDO. And if you look at scars that were greater than 10%, uh, most of the wounds with CDO, almost 80%, were greater than 10% scar reduction versus over 70% when the control group were less than 10% uh, scar reduction. And that is it for mine. So let's turn it over to Dr. Chan. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was fascinating. And uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Brian Chan. Brian is an affiliate scientist with the Neural Engineering and Therapeutics team at Kite, part of the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute. As well, he's an assistant professor at the Institute of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. His research focuses on economic evaluations and health technology assessments for individuals requiring rehabilitation, including spinal cord injury. He's published studies on, on the cost of pressure ulcer management for individuals with spinal cord injury, the cost of hospitalized acquired pressure ulcers, and the cost effectiveness of electrical stimulation therapy for spinal cord injured individuals with pressure ulcers. Please uh, welcome Dr. Brian Chan. Thank you, Karen, for that introduction. And thank you, Mark, for that presentation uh, of the clinical outcomes associated with um, CDO. And that is a great segue on what I will be presenting next. If we go to the next slide. Because Mark had presented on specifically in the first part of uh, his presentation on some of the uh, positive outcomes that are associated with this therapy, namely the uh, improvements in the, the healing rate of individuals experiencing diabetic foot ulcers. If we take a look at that from an economic perspective, uh, improvement in the number of individuals healed of the diabetic foot ulcers has to have some sort of uh, economic implications to uh, healthcare system because you no longer have to treat individuals with diabetic foot ulcers and they no longer have to go through different types of treatments to try and uh, get at healing and also they uh, reduce the risk of the secondary complications that uh, occur that are associated with the diabetic foot ulcers and if you go to the next slide however if we are to administer this treatment, there's also a cost associated with it. With this uh, device there that uh, it needs to be used, there is a cost associated with that, uh, with the um, offloading, as well as uh, the, the changes in, uh, in bandages and whatnot. So if we go to the next slide, the question becomes, if we are to, uh, to pay for this technology so that individuals have access 
to it. Uh, how, how do we value that compared to the improvements in uh, outcomes that could occur? So there's a cost with, associated with delivering the intervention, but there may be some cost benefit in the future because of improvements in outcomes. If you go to the next slide. So that is the question that um, I had looking forward uh, when, as we conduct an economic evaluation. Uh, looking at uh, CDO. And the study question that I posed for this study was to evaluate uh, whether CDO was cost effective when treating individuals with advanced diabetic foot ulcers compared to negative pressure wound therapy from the perspective of the public health care payer in Ontario. And so there are some things that we have to focus on here in this study question that being that this is a cost effectiveness study. So we are comparing both the cost as well as the outcomes of both CDO as well as negative pressure wound therapy. The reason why negative pressure wound therapy was chosen as the comparator is because in terms of accessibility, uh, in terms of the uh, possible ability to deliver this intervention from home, and also a similar patient population for treating diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, those, those reasons were why uh, negative pressure wound therapy was chosen as the comparator. However, when we get into some of the, uh, some of the sensitivity analysis, we are going to take a look at some other alternatives as well to see how that affects the results. Another thing to focus on as well is the perspective. So this is from the perspective of the Ontario public health care payer. So um, the results I'll be pre presenting to you are for that jurisdiction. So let's go to the next slide. So let's get into some specifics about what was conducted. So we took a, in, an individual and what we did was we projected over a five year time frame. We uh, looked at this individual if they were to receive CDO as well as the associated uh, clinical outcomes that are uh, connected with this intervention, that being the uh, po possibility in it, this individual will be healed at six weeks. And then we took a look at if we were to project their uh, over a five-year period, what their cumulative costs are as well as their cumulative outcomes are, if we go to the next slide, then we can uh, take a look at what their five year, this individual's five year cost and outcomes are. The outcomes of interest in uh, this economic evaluation was the quality adjusted life years, which is in terms of economic evaluations is the gold standard because this is an outcome that can be applied to different interventions, uh, analysis of different populations, because it is a accumulation of improvements in life expectancy as a result of receiving the intervention, as well as the quality of that, that life. So that's why it's called quality adjusted life years. So if we calculate the cumulative cost and quality adjusted life years over five years for an individual receiving uh, CDO, and then next slide, if we then take the same individual and then take a look at if they were to receive negative pressure wound therapy instead and the outcomes in terms of healing associated with that and then also project in terms of five years next slide their cumulative cost and quality adjusted life years then we can do a comparison however we don't want to only focus on uh, calculating this for one individual if we go to the next slide but instead uh, we would repeat this 10,000 times for a uh, cohort of 10,000 individuals. And these individuals will change based uh, on, change on their sex as well as their age. And this will be based on a similar population as that seen in the clinical trial that um, Mark had presented earlier on in, in his presentation. So let's go to the next slide. Now to get a bit more specific, what we did what to be able to project individuals and their costs and their outcomes over a five-year time frame was we put them into something called a Markov model. 
So based on their outcomes of whether they are healed or not, they would be in different health states, mutually exclusive health states. And then over time, individuals have a chance or a probability of moving into different types of health states. And each one of them have their associated costs and associated outcomes. And then we tally that over time. Let's go to the next slide. So let's go then now to the results. I want to start off by presenting to you what we saw in terms of the treatment cost. Uh, and he, in this case, this would be the number, the treatment cost per week. And as you can see, when we had costed out the CDO treatment compared to the negative pressure wound therapy, just the treatment cost itself was uh, much higher for the negative pressure wound therapy. And there are two main reasons for that. First one being the cost of the equipment itself, uh, both the rental and the, um, the other costs associated with it, but also the um, staffing time required for, uh, for addressing changes. So that being higher for negative pressure wound therapy than CDO. So it comes to no surprise combining the, the lower cost of treatment as well as the uh, higher improvements in terms of wound healing that over a five-year time frame, when we take a look at a cohort of individuals, that CDO on average costs less and also has better outcomes in terms of quality adjusted life years than that of negative pressure wound therapy. Next slide. What we also did was uh, we took that 10,000 population and we ran this cohort repeatedly taking into consideration the uncertainty re resulting from the outcomes of the clinical trials and some of the model inputs that we've included in uh, our analysis. And we found that uh, when we took a look at all the number of times that we've repeated the simulation over and over, we found that um, almost 80% of the time we had the same outcome, that being lower cost and uh, higher quality adjusted life years for CDO compared to negative pressure wound therapy. Next slide. We then took a look at some sensitivity analysis. So changing some of the inputs, taking a look at other assumptions that we could make and taking a look at what the impact would be on the outcome of our results. So we took a look at uh, comparing CDO to uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, taking a look at it versus just advanced uh, moist wound therapy, um, and even taking a look at if we, there was a, if individuals were always de had debridement at follow-up visits, uh, larger ulcer sizes, uh, greater chronicity of the diabetic foot ulcers, we found that overall the results were uh, consistent, that being that there was a reduction in cost and there was improvement in quality adjusted life years, showing that depending on the population, if you were to make modifications to the population or the, the uh, type of treatment that was uh, the comparator, uh, that the results remain robust. Next slide. However, there, there are some limitations to keep in mind, uh, this being a study that requires projection it uh, will have, there will be some assumptions that occur. This being a study about uh, economics and from the perspective of a specific healthcare system, then there are limitations, of course. That being the results are specific to that, uh, the Ontario healthcare system and may differ if we take a look at another healthcare system. Also, something to keep in mind was that um, there is currently no evidence comparing CDO to some of the other treatments that I presented, that being negative pressure wound therapy or hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So we had to make some indirect comparisons in that, that case. But um, if there was in the future a direct comparison, then we can provide some updates to economic evaluations. And there um, may be changes to the outcomes. There may not be. But also, there um, was a lot of assumptions that were required in terms of long-term outcomes um, because there isn't any studies with CDO that have uh, long-term outcomes beyond one year. We had to um, 
create some projections, but if there are future studies looking at the long-term outcomes of CDO, then we can have uh, a, a more uh, robust economic evaluation. Okay, next slide, please. However, based on the evidence that we do have currently, and based on the, the calculation of its the economic evaluations of CDO, we find that uh, CDO results in lower cost as well as slight improvements in quality adjusted life years when we compare it to negative pressure wound therapy. We also see that with hyperbaric oxygen therapy as well as advanced wound dressings. And we find that overall the re these results appear robust even when we incorporate ass uh, different assumptions and uh, also include uncertainty into our analysis as well. And the st study has uh, been published very recently in the International Wound Journal. And if you'd like more information or read more about the study, you can find it there. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Brian. Now, I'm going to uh, take over again, and I've got some, two interesting cases. Now, these were two cases from uh, PEI and Kathy Much uh, was involved with both patients that she's unavailable so I'm going to be presenting them for her. And so the first case is a 69 year old male who has a history of venous disease. He was wearing compression hose uh, to uh, treat the venous disease. He had no history of DDTs but did have superficial varicosities and stasis dermatitis bilaterally. Excuse me, he had a history of liver cirrhosis and in March of 2019 he had a painful lesion in his left medial leg for greater than two months. The patient uh, told Kathy that this started as a black dot. Uh, when they did their assessment, his ankle brachial pressure indexes were 1.27 bilaterally and you can see that the wound was 2 by 1.5 centimeters. It had uh, some necrotic tissue, eschar, and some uh, viable wound bed um, in that wound. He had bilateral leg edema, and he was on antibiotic. So they started treating him with a silver gel. They put him back into his compression hose, and they debrided his wound. And so there you can see a picture of this gentleman's leg, and that was March 11, 2019. Uh, March 25th, he missed an appointment. March 28th, he arrived. He was in a lot of pain. The wound was quite a bit bigger. So now we're 6.5 by 5.5 centimeters. And they started him on Hydrofera Blue and the Coban 2 Light for compression. April 7th, again, the wound was bigger. Um, there was a lot of slough in the wound bed, um, both adherent and as well as uh, loose eschar. They continued with the Hydrofera Blue and Coban 2 Light as well. The wound was debrided that day. April 9th, he arrived in clinic with increased pain, reporting his pain was a 10 out of 10. The wound uh, was 7 um, by 6. The eschar was starting to lift. And there was some granulation uh, notice, but this individual, because of his pain, wasn't, uh, was sl wasn't sleeping. He did feel better when his leg was dependent, which obviously increases his edema. And uh, EO2 therapy was initiated with compression. So now you can see what this uh, ulcer looked like on April 9th. But now look at this wound on uh, June the 4th, uh, 2009. So we go from a patient reporting his pain was 10 out of 10 to reporting his pain was now a zero out of 10. They were able to um, use EO2 up to this point with a combination of appropriate compression, but because the wound was healing uh, gangbusters, uh, the EO2 was discontinued at this point. It went on to heal and close completely on uh, July uh, 11th. And so you can see there's quite a difference from the before, but also we were able to manage this um, individual's pain. Uh, but then he arrived back in clinic um, saying he now had a new ulcer in his right lower leg, noting that the ulcer uh, previously I discussed was on his left uh, leg. And again, he reported that the pain was 10 out of 10 with this new wound. 
and so EO2 was actually started then on the uh, right leg, but by uh, July 11th, the wound was fully granulated, and again, he had no pain. It went from a 10 out of 10 to a 0 out of 10. And this wound um, closed completely as well. So we have an individual who had significant pain, were able to manage the pain as well as heal his wounds. The second case uh, is a young uh, person with uh, diabetes type 1, end-stage kidney disease, hypertension, significant arterial disease. He uh, had a BKA and you can see um, the amputation site. He had wounds on both sides of the amputation site. And this, um, this photo was taken in July and the team on PEI was trying to prevent another amputation because this, this person could have ended up with an above knee amputation. Uh, and as we all know, uh, dealing with uh, amputees we want to be able to um, fit individuals for the right devices and um, if we can heal a wound with a BAK and prevent an another amputation, that's a good outcome. So I'm gonna be walking you through the wound healing because this amputation site has wounds both a lateral and medial. So initially, um, you're gonna see the before and after as we walk through the wound healing part. So you can see with the, with the lateral um, amputation site, we start on July 4th. We still have quite a bit of necrotic tissue on July the 10th uh, and, and July the 19th. And, but look at this patient now, um, August 30th using a CDO. We have uh, lifted all of the uh, necrotic tissue. Uh, we've got a fairly healthy wound bed and the wound size is contracting very, very nicely. Uh, September 27th, again, the wound is significantly smaller. We have a little bit of slough in the wound bed, but the CDO was uh, continued. Uh, and there we are, December 17th. That actual wound went on to close completely. I just don't have a photo of that um, closed wound, but I'd like to walk you through now the medial wound from that amputation site. So you can see uh, in one week, um, we have a little bit cleaner uh, wound bed from July 4th to the 10th. Uh, and then look at this wound on July 19th. It's got a lot of healthy granulation tissue. There's a little tiny bit of slough, um, but the wound is responding very well to EO2. Uh, July 25th, again, um, we've got a little bit of necrotic tissue um, in that wound, but 90% of the wound bed is very healthy, beefy granulation tissue. August 1st, you can see that this wound size has contracted significantly and is quite a bit smaller. And then we have a closed wound on September 27th. So we've, I've presented two cases, uh, one showing uh, how we can manage pain uh, and heal wounds, and a second show how we can heal fairly significant uh, wounds that have uh, uh, arterial disease and prevent a further amputation. Now we're actually going to be turning it over to questions. Uh, you're going to be typing your questions into the Q&A box, but I've also put up here emails for both myself, Edie, uh, Mark, as well as the EO2 website. There's quite a bit of information uh, on the website. There are YouTube videos. There's all sorts of um, white papers, uh, summaries of research that, that Mark spoke about, but you can also email us with uh, questions that you have. Um, first question, I think I'm going to turn this over to Mark. Uh, hello, I, I hear you talking about EO2 and CDO. Can you explain to us the difference, please? Sure. So <clears throat> EO2 is our company name. It stands for Electrochemical Oxygen Concepts, or EO2 Concepts. CDO is Continuous Diffusion of Oxygen. And the reason we use that term is because most people uh, think of topical oxygen as the, the ch chambers or bags that have been around. They're intermittent. They're only 90 minutes a day, typically three to five days a week. We're on 24-7, like a mini respirator. 
Thank you, Mark. Actually, the next question I'm going to actually ask you to answer as well, and I may add in a little bit at the end. So the question is, what do you think of the practice of a physical therapist using oxygen with a bag and a tube and a tube to deliver oxygen to the wound via bag, either, I guess, from uh, um, an oxygen at, at a bedside or thoughts on that, Mark? Sorry, it, the question broke up a little bit. Could you repeat it? So what do you think of the practice of a physical therapist using continuous diffusion of oxygen with a bag and uh, an oxygen tube inserted into, into the bag to deliver oxygen to the wound that way? Oh, so simultaneously? Yes. Okay. Um, it probably wouldn't hurt. The main thing to you want to watch out for is not to dry the wound out because uh, with CDO therapy, we use a fuel cell to generate humidified oxygen. So it's a low flow stream of uh, humid oxygen. It's about 50 to 60% humidity. And that won't ever dry the wound out. In fact, we actually have to worry more about exudate control with the wound. So using any type of other bag or something like that, uh, if it's not humidified, those typically have high flow oxygen. Oxygen by itself is dry, it could dry the wound out. It would stop the oxygen penetrating or hinder it. I'd just like to add on to that, uh, Mark, that if you used a bag and you know oxygen delivered by a tube, you may only be able to deliver oxygen for an hour, hour and a half a day. The advantage of uh, CDO is that it's delivering oxygen to the moon 24 seven um, because it's a very small device. It's wearable, correct. It's totally wearable um, and patients can be, you know, ambulatory, moving around to hurt from Bill. Uh, and so it's something that can deliver oxygen 24 seven. Mm -hmm. um, now this um, is a question for you, um, Evie. Can you explain how uh, CDO is installed on the patient? Um, yes. Put on. <laughs> Uh, it's a very simple dressing, as uh, you heard from Bill, saying that he was able to independently apply his dressing. And um, it's, uh, you take the back off the dressing and you put it over the wound and that is it. There's uh, interlocking tubing that goes, uh, you lock it in onto the dressing, you run the tube up to the machine. If it's a lower leg ulcer, uh, the tubing can go up through the pant leg and you're wearing uh, the Oxygeny on your hip uh, in a little uh, fanny pack, if you will. And um, yes, thanks, Mark. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's light and you just turn it on and you have a continuous flow of oxygen 24 seven, very easy to manage, uh, no noise uh, from the device and it's, um, it's very comfortable to wear. Thanks Edie. I think the next question is for Brian. Back therapy generally cannot bring wounds to full closure. CDO, as I understand, can. Was that taken into consideration in the economic impact? Yeah, so for the economic evaluation, um, I used uh, healing rates based on um, best available literature. So um, there were some studies showing uh, rates of uh, full closure healing, uh, not, not at the same level as um, CDO. Um, but that, that was considered in the, uh, the economic evaluation. Now, good next, question, thank you. Yeah, good question. Next question I think is for Edie. Uh, can you put CDO over a wound that has fibrin in it? Or is it better to have 100% granulation tissue for CDO to work? That's a great question. Um, Certainly, you want to prepare the wound bed to receive the therapy and uh, ongoing uh, debridement, if that's required, uh, is, is um, an excellent start. Uh, depending on if you can tell the difference of, of fibrin and uh, other components in the wound bed, the answer basically is yes, you can put it over top. It does not work well if you try to put the dressing over top of necrotic or sloughy tissue. So you want to remove the devitalized tissue prior to initiating and uh, putting on the dressing.
Edie, I'd just like to add in, there's been a few times and we've had patients where pain is an issue and we've not been able to debride them as well as what we would have liked. Uh, and we have had uh, success with uh, CDO. It does help facilitate um, autolytic debridement, but I 100% agree with you, this works best when the wound has been successfully debrided. Now, another question uh, for you, Edie, what kind of dressings can you use with the CDO therapy? Um, you can use a variety of primary dressings, uh, but uh, you don't want to use anything that has petrolatum in it, uh, such as um, uh, Sofretool or, or uh, items like that. Uh, we have used um, antimicrobial dressings, uh, silver ionized dressings um, that um, uh, deal with um, um, uh, trying to minimize the bacterial load in the wound bed. Uh, some have actually used gauze underneath the wound bed. And so uh, if the bottom of the dressing uh, does not touch the bottom of the wound because of depth, you certainly can instill a primary dressing into the wound bed. So hydrofibers, calcium alginates um, are all fine to use. Um, blue dressings as well if you're you're trying to clean up an antimicrobial uh, challenge. So uh, anything but petrolatum um, is supportive to uh, using as a primary dressing. Great, if, I could, if I could add on, a rule of thumb is if water can go through the dressing, you can use it with our, our dressing, our system. So as Mark said, if you had a dressing that had an inclusive top layer, uh, you wouldn't want to put that onto the wound first and then try to have the oxygen diffuse through that. I've actually had a couple of questions here about funding. So I'm going to read both questions and I'll try to answer them. What sources of funding pay for CDO and EO2? And as well, um, how I sort of going along with that, um, what is the product availability? Um, are we able to access this in various parts of the country? And let me tell you what our experience is. So uh, currently the products available on PEI, Nova Scotia, BC and Saskatchewan. And in addition, two other provinces are looking at trialing on, on some patients. And uh, regarding cost, a CDO is less expensive than a negative pressure wind therapy, and you heard um, Brian speak about that. And regarding the issue um, in Ontario, I've actually had questions about whether or not the products are available for Ontario health teams. And I wondered if in the question you were meeting the LINs, um, because I'm not sure that the family health teams would be prescribing uh, something like CDO. Uh, I would see it rather being prescribed uh, within the LIN by um, a wound clinician. And uh, at this point, in at, in time in Ontario, there is no LIN that is using the device. We've actually had patients who have been willing to pay for the treatment themselves, um, but um, we haven't had uh, a LIN pay for it. But um, hopefully that will change in the future as we get more experience and, and, and clinicians get more experience and start advocating for this important therapy for, for their patients. I don't know if anyone would want to add anything in on that. Edie, if you would add anything else or? Uh, I think that as clinicians do work with the product and see the results and uh, see the cost efficiencies and the wound outcomes from the use of CDO, that um, there's always opportunity to do the evaluations and support materials management in uh, looking closely at yet another adjunctive therapy and um, uh, looking at uh, supporting the cost of, of the therapy. And when they start seeing cost efficiencies, uh, you know, people that are uh, paying for the therapies, government programs, things like this, it does, if you can show cost efficiencies and positive outcomes, uh, there is uh, less of a reluctance to look at uh, another adjunctive therapy.
Great. I had another question um, about whether or not uh, we ever use an, enzy an enzymatic debriding agent before using uh, CO, C CDO. And actually, we wouldn't want to use um, any, something like Santa, which is the only enzymatic debriding agent available in Canada, because it has petrolatum in it. It could be potentially used before CDO is started, uh, as long as you have a bit of a washout period, because the petrolatum interferes with the absorption of, uh, of the oxygen. And um, uh, lots and lots of questions about uh, debridement, uh, and which I think we've, we've, we've already answered. Obviously, it's most important, if we can, to uh, debride these wounds, but sometimes it's actually not um, possible. Um, another question, um, what are your thoughts uh, regarding applying CDO in arterial ulcers after debridement? I learned that it's not advisable to, to debride wounds where blood supply, hence O2 availability is compromised. Edie and Mark, can you comment on that? Well, I could comment on it from, for example, the study we talked about with the painful ulcers. Those were uh, primarily our, uh, leg ulcers that had an arterial component. And so it, it actually worked better in those for the pain relief. And, and it worked fine. I mean, you saw overall we had an 83% response rate. And the nurses think that's primarily due to some patients not being compliant because once their pain went away, uh, they took the device off because they, they thought they were, they were, at least it wasn't bothering them anymore. Um, but yeah, so it, it, we've seen not only in that trial, but also in the field, uh, it seems to work very well in that, in that arena. Edie? Uh, I would just like to add that um, it's very important to identify what the arterial component uh, of the lower limb is. So lower leg assessment is, is hugely important and that the outcomes of those assessments are uh, driving your treatment options. So as a clinician, when you get your uh, ankle brachial indexes back and uh, toe pressures back, you are going to make a clinical decision whether A, the wound is healable, and if it is, um, you want to proceed to uh, support that, that patient and their wound to closure. If the wound is not deemed to be healable, then perhaps you don't want to debride the eschgar uh, from that arterial ulcer and maybe uh, an oxygen therapy, adjunctive therapy would not, not be appropriate for that patient. Thanks, thanks Edie. Another question for Mark. Uh, is oxygen the only therapeutic agent in CT? CDO, is this technology antibacterial as well? And if yes, then what makes it antibacterial? Okay. So yes, the only therapeutic in this is oxygen. It's, it's really more of a nutrient that supplies the body to support various me metabolic processes. Um, it's, when it's generated by the device, it is basically pure, uh, greater 99% oxygen. Uh, what it does to support the uh, antibacterial process, you can, you can go on our website and there's also some really good papers by Chan and Sen and some other doctors out there that talk about how auction works in wound healing. And that's our guidance document. We, we basically summarize what they've said. Um, but what it does for antibacterial in the wound bed is it supports autolytic debridement and, and antibacterial activities by allowing the supplying auction so that the uh, macrophages and leukocytes can use that oxygen to create reactive oxygen species and degrade or break apart not only the, the dead cells, but also invading organisms such as bacteria and other things. Great. And uh, a clinical question from someone, how often is the dressing changed? And I'll get started and then I'll have Edie add, uh, add in. In theory, um, what happens with this dressing is like any other dressing. And so it can stay on in theory for up to a week, but as you, as you all know, what happens in reality and what happens in theory can be different. And so uh, initially we see an increase in exudate with uh, using CDO. And so uh, 
Often then initially when we start patients with this treatment, they may have to have dressing changes three times a week, four times a week, but that actually settles down after a week or two and um, we can go to less frequent dressing changes. But honestly, the frequency of the dressing changes is impacted by the amount of exudate, as well as the type of, of uh, dressings that you're, that you're putting on the, on the wound. And so you're going to want to apply um, a uh, dressing that's going to be more absorptive if you have more exudate and, and so on. Edie, would you add anything to that? Uh, I would. Um, if, you're, if you are seeing uh, the increase of exudate and uh, you're not using a primary dressing, just the uh, CDO dressing, even with the primary dressing, you may want to use a skin prep to the peri wound area just to protect it um, and uh, make a clinical judgment about the frequency of your dressing changes by checking checking the dressing after the first 24 hours of application and making a clinical judgment that maybe you want to change the dressing two or three times a week and then extend your dressing change times based on once the exudate levels have leveled off. But certainly using um, a skin prep uh, in the peri wound area will protect your margins and reduce the um, challenge of maceration. And uh, it's um, it's it's a good consideration, especially in the first one to three weeks of of initiating the therapy. Thank you all. And I'm going to actually close it off because our hour is up. I can't believe how quickly it went by. I'd like to thank our amazing presenters for their engaging talk and thank you for attending today's webinar, Continuous Diffusion of Oxygen in Wound Healing, Promoting Patient Independence and Cost Effectiveness. If you have any questions, please contact any one of us by email or contact Wounds Canada at info at woundscanada.ca. You will receive a follow-up email within 48 hours with a link to view the recording of today's webinar from Wounds Canada, along with a survey link where you'll have an opportunity to sign up for more information from EO2. Please complete the survey to provide us with your valuable feedback. And on behalf of Edie, Brian, Mark, EO2 and Wounds Canada, thank you for joining us today and have a great evening.